Hello again, AP Calculus AB students. What we're going to be talking about today uh, is the final portion of section 2.2. You've been talking about the shortcut derivatives, which has been really nice. Now we're going to look at the first application, and it's entitled Rates of Change, uh, which seems like it might be a little bit vague. But I'm going to kind of talk about two different kinds of rates of change with this particular problem, and you'll see the connection that it has to calculus. Our example here says that we have a billiard ball that's dropped from a height of 100 feet. Its height, s, at any time t, is given by this equation. s of t is equal to negative 16 t squared plus 100. s is measured in feet, t is measured in seconds. Our job for part a is to find the average velocity of the ball over the given time intervals, and we have three different ones to look at. Now, I want you to understand that this initial problem has absolutely nothing to do with calculus. This is a problem that you could have conceivably have seen in an algebra class. And secondly, at this particular juncture, I don't want you to worry a whole lot about where this equation comes from. Eventually, I want you to get very comfortable in how to, how to uh, put together this equation given the information that's given. That's going to be in the next video. So for our part A, our first time interval will be from one second to two seconds. Well, to find an average velocity, all you've got to do is sort of think about your old school formula for relating distance, velocity, and time. And that formula, hopefully you remember, is distance equals rate times time, where rate is sort of acting like our velocity. Well, if you were to solve this for rate or velocity, of course you would just divide a t over, so the rate would be distance over time. And that's exactly what you're going to do here. You want to figure out what distance did the ball travel from time one to time two, and then divide that by the time interval between these two. So the first part of it is going to involve you having to actually evaluate this position equation. That's what S gives you. This equation is telling you at any moment how high is that ball off the ground at a certain time. Just to see that it works, plug in zero. Let time be zero. What's the position? Well, of course, 100. Makes sense, doesn't it? We haven't dropped the ball yet. At time zero, the ball would be at 100 feet. But as we let time become other numbers, we're going to see that this negative value will take on and, and actually take away from that 100, and thus we're getting it closer to the ground. So in this particular case, you want to find the position at time two, subtract the position at time one, and simply divide by 2 minus 1. Now, would it make a difference if I had swapped these 1s and 2s? No, it wouldn't. In fact, it probably would make more sense because the position of the ball is probably going to be higher off the ground at time 1 than it is at time 2, so you might be expecting perhaps a negative number here. Well, at this point, um, you could use a calculator, obviously, to plug these values in. We might have to go that route, especially for part two and part three. I'm hoping that maybe we can handle this without the use of a calculator in this case because we are dealing with easy integers one and two. So if we were to plug two in for t, square the two, you'd have four. Multiply by negative 16, you'd have negative 64 plus 100 would be 36. That simply means that the ball is 36 feet off the ground at time two. How high was it off the ground at time one? Plug 1 in, we have negative 16 plus 100, obviously is what, 84? So the ball is 84 feet off the ground at time 1. Once again, it doesn't make it any difference at all if these are backwards, as long as you're consistent with what's going down in the denominator, and I still want to go 2 minus 1 to keep with this order. 2 minus 1 is, of course, 1. And when I go ahead and simplify this, uh, what do we get there? Is that uh, 48, I believe? or negative 48, and that would be correct. Now you've got to think about the label here. This is going to be very important throughout all of this particular lesson. And if our top is a measurement of distance, that would be of course in feet, but we are dividing that by a difference of time, which is measured in seconds. So our label here would be feet per second. You're going to do the exact same thing with parts two and three. Once again, it makes no difference the order in which you choose to subtract. I'll still keep with the second point minus the first point. Now here, 
I don't feel real comfortable yet taking 1.5 squared and multiplying by negative 16. I can do a lot of things, but I can't quite do that. So let's go ahead and evaluate this. Um, there's a variety of ways that you can do this, of course. Um, you can use the such that um, command in your calculator, or you could just rely on a table. So if I were to take uh, negative 16, multiply it by 1.5 squared, hopefully you guys are punching this along with me, and then add 100, then I could subtract the quantity. Well, let's not reinvent the wheel here. Haven't we already figured out the position of this ball at time 1? We could just borrow this value here and just type in 84. And in doing so, I would have negative 20 on the top. You want to verify to make sure you can get the same thing. And then on the bottom, clearly 1.5 minus 1 is 0.5. Divide 20 by 0.5 and you should get 40 with the negative sign along with it. So we have at negative 40 feet per second as an average, vo average velocity on this time interval. You might notice that this longer interval produces a slightly faster velocity than over here. Let's see what's going on on a shorter interval from 1 to 1.1. 1 .1. So once again, I will take the position at 1.1 and subtract the position at 1 and divide that by the difference of those two times. Once again, I'm going to use the calculator and type negative 16 times the quantity 1.1 squared plus 100. And then once again, I'm just subtracting the position at time 1, which is again is 84. That will give me a numerator of negative 3.36, which of course would be over 0.1. If you want to take that division, of course you could probably do that in your head, but if you don't feel comfortable, divide it. You're just moving the decimal point over one spot, and you would get negative 33.6 feet per second. So you can see that we are slower still on the shorter time interval. It's almost to say that this ball is picking up speed the longer it drops. That makes sense, especially when you're talking about time interval one to two seconds. Now this uh, part here, which I apologize, that should actually be part B, says, what do you notice about the signs of each answer? Well, we've got negative 48 feet per second, negative 40 feet per second, and negative 33.6 feet per second. Ah, of course, they're all negative. Okay. We'll say that. Now the big question, oops, I want to say they're negative. The big question is why is this the case? They're negative because why? Well, you want to be thinking about velocity as having a sign that sort of tells you a direction that it's going. It's pretty clear that this ball is dropping. If you're going to drop this ball on this planet, there's this thing called gravity that's going to act on it, and it's always going to cause the ball to fall. And you will notice that falling objects will always have these negative velocities, since the distance the ball or the object is from the planet surface is always going to be getting smaller. So we'll say just simply because the ball is falling. And that takes care of the first part of example six, which is basically talking about an algebraic approach. Now if we look at part C, this is where the calculus comes into play. And it also happens to be where the problem gets easier. Because now I've got this other adjective describing velocity called instantaneous velocity. Now, instantaneous velocity is not something that's measured on a time interval. You will see that I have it set at very specific times. That's the power of calculus. Using calculus, and specifically the derivative, you can find out exactly how fast that ball drops at any moment. It's almost like you have the power to take a snapshot with a camera and freeze time, look at that ball as it's hovering in midair, and do a quick calculation of its speed, and then you could push play and let the ball continue to drop. So in this particular case, we're going to have to remember that the position 
s of t was negative 16 t squared plus 100. The instantaneous velocity is associated with the derivative. So you would want to take the derivative of this. And that s prime of t that you would have here would be negative 32t plus the derivative of zero, or 100, of course, is going to be zero. So this would be your derivative, which I want you to also be comfortable with the fact that's equal to your velocity. S prime and V will always be the same thing. So if we want to find out specific velocities, all we have to do, say for part one, is plug in one. Okay, what's negative 32 times one? Negative 32. Just like all other velocities, this is of course measured in feet per second. Okay, we want to find the velocity 1.5 seconds. Okay, the ball's falling a little bit longer, a half second more. How fast is it going now in part two? Well, the velocity at 1.5, perhaps you might use your calculator, you may not have to. Negative 32 times 1.5 is just negative 32 times 1 plus half of more of negative 32, which is another negative 16. Whatever you need to do, verify the fact that it is negative 48. And then finally, at time two, we would say, okay, the velocity at time two would be negative 32 times two, which in this case is negative 64 feet per second. Now, of course, you, you, you can try to compare the results with part C with part A, but you've got to keep in mind that part A, where it's giving you an average velocity over a time interval, these are probably a little bit more powerful because it's an it's an exact instantaneous velocity at a specific time. In the next videos, you're going to tackle some more specific problems and also take it to a next level where you're going to be able to answer a lot more questions about what's going on with the fallen object rather than just its velocity. You'll be able to find things like uh, how long does it take for the object to hit the ground? Uh, what was the velocity at the time of impact? You'll like those.